Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. This article helps us understand how the emergence of drones has disrupted and transformed warfare, especially hybrid warfare. According to this article, India's border security force has shot down a drone that was reportedly carrying arms and explosives. This incident has occurred in Jammu and Kashmir along the international border with Pakistan and this has led the BSF to conclude that the drone might have come in from Pakistan by crossing across the international border. The drone that was captured was carrying an American-made M4 carbine gun and a few Chinese grenades as a part of its payload. But the most worrying aspect is that this drone was a commercially available hexacopter that was manufactured in China. This incident goes on to show how commercially available drones can be used to threaten a country's national security. And such incidents not only pose a new challenge to border management, but it also goes on to show how drones can be used to disrupt and transform hybrid warfare. But before we get into this topic, first let us understand the difference between conventional warfare and hybrid warfare. See, a conventional warfare is fought with conventional weapons. Along with these conventional options, when unconventional and asymmetric options are also used, the warfare turns into hybrid warfare. So when unconventional and asymmetric weapons and warfighting techniques are clubbed with conventional warfighting techniques, we get hybrid warfare which can subvert the enemy. Now let us look at some of these unconventional and asymmetric options. Examples include the usage of a proxy terror group in order to subvert the enemy, the usage of psychological warfare techniques such as the spreading of fake news, misinformation and propaganda, carrying out cyber attacks, especially against critical installations, and along with this, the usage of armed drones to carry out precision attacks against high-value targets has also emerged as an unconventional asymmetric option, which has of late transformed the nature of hybrid warfare. See, when we think of drones, there are two types of drones that come to our mind. One is military drones that are relatively bigger in size almost the size of a regular fighter aircraft and they are classified as unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned combat aerial vehicles. These military drones are remotely piloted using satellite based navigation and military drones known as UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles are used for various military applications such as aerial reconnaissance, intelligence gathering, surveillance etc. The best examples for these UAVs in the case of India would be the Heron and Searcher drone that is operated by India, which India has imported from Israel. Then we also have the Rustum series of UAVs and Nishant that are currently being indigenously developed by the DRDO. These drones that are currently operated by India, they are just unmanned aerial vehicles and they are not armed drones. They cannot be used in combat and they do not carry any weapons on board. Apart from UAVs, we have unmanned combat aerial vehicles that can be used to deliver missiles with great precision against high-value targets and they can also be used to deliver specific payloads. Under the Rustum program, DRDO is currently developing an armed version of the Rustum drone as well. But it is the United States which has made unmanned combat aerial vehicles extremely popular in armed combat with the effective usage of Predator and Reaper drones. The United States has used these drones very effectively to carry out precision attacks against high-value targets such as terror leaders in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Yemen, etc. The reason why these military drones have transformed warfare is because they provide a number of advantages. They basically provide a low-cost, low-risk option to a country for collecting intelligence and for carrying out precision attacks. Compared to conventional weapons and conventional defense platforms such as fighter planes, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, satellites, etc. Military drones offer a much cheaper option. For a country which is looking to carry out surveillance and intelligence gathering, military drones provide a cheaper option as compared to satellites. The technology is readily available and it doesn't cost much to build these drones. And for a country which is looking to carry out aerial attacks against high-value targets, it provides a low-risk option. Since these drones are unmanned and since they are remotely piloted, the country is not putting its soldiers or its pilots in the line of fire and this significantly reduces the element of risk as far as drone-based warfare is concerned. 
The usage of military drones in combat, especially by the United States, has raised a number of ethical concerns on the grounds that it leads to blatant violation of human rights. The allegation is that since these drones are remotely piloted, it has basically turned war into a video game. Since these drones are unmanned and remotely piloted, it takes away the human element and it takes away the human empathy angle which can be brought in by a pilot or a soldier who has been deployed in the battlefield. The ethical concern is that the usage of military drones, especially armed drones, can reduce war fighting to mere numbers and targets that are displayed on a screen because the remote pilot is sitting in a secure airbase thousands of kilometers away from the actual battlefield. These ethical concerns are very valid because American drone strikes in Afghanistan, Syria and Yemen have repeatedly resulted in unacceptable collateral damage leading to the death of innocent civilians for the sake of killing one single terrorist. While these are the complicated dimensions related to the usage of military drones such as unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned combat aerial vehicles, the emergence of commercial mini drones and their usage in carrying out swarm attacks has given rise to a new set of complicated dimensions and a new set of issues and challenges. These mini drones that are commercially available, they find numerous commercial applications as toys, they are used in disaster management, they are used for agriculture and forest management, they are used by police forces to carry out surveillance and crowd management, they are also used to carry out home deliveries by private corporations. Such mini drones which are usually used for civilian applications, they can be easily misused by both state and non-state actors to create security challenges. By using artificial intelligence algorithms, these commercially available mini drones can be made completely autonomous and they can be made to coordinate with each other and operate as a swarm just like a swarm of insects and carry out a synchronized attack against a desired target. So over the last three to four years, drone swarming or swarm attacks have emerged as a real national security threat. Take for example how in December 2018 a bunch of miscreants used a swarm of drones to disrupt the functioning of the busy Gatwick airport in London. Then in another incident, a Russian airbase in Syria was brought under attack by a swarm of drones and Russia blamed a rebel group backed by the United States to be responsible for this attack. Then recently in September 2019, Saudi Arabia's Aramco, which is the world's largest oil refiner, its oil refining plants came under a major attack by a bunch of swarm drones which were operating autonomously and coordinating with each other. And Saudi Arabia blamed this attack on the Houthi rebels of Yemen who are backed by Iran. This swarm attack using drones on Saudi Arabia's Aramco oil refining plants ended up disrupting the global oil markets for a few weeks. Then over the last two years, we have also seen Pakistan trying to smuggle weapons and even drugs across the border into India. And this definitely poses a grave challenge to India's national security and border management. It is not just non-state actors such as terror groups which are looking to use commercially available mini drones to carry out attacks by using the drone swarming technique. But even state actors such as armed forces and defense organizations of countries such as United States, United Kingdom, Russia and China, they have already developed such mini drones and deployed them which are capable of carrying out autonomous coordinated attacks by using the drone swarming technique. Even India's HAL has launched a program known as Alpha S to develop such swarm drones for the Indian Armed Forces. So this discussion helps us understand how drones have disrupted and transformed warfare, especially hybrid warfare. Now let's take up another article from page number one. Tahavur Rana arrested again after release in United States. The article also says that 2611 accused proposed to be extradited in an NIA case. See this article helps us understand the global roots and linkages of terrorism. See this article is relevant to us in the context of the 2611 attacks. We all know that the 2611 attacks was India's 9-11 moment. During these attacks for three days a bunch of Pakistani trained terrorists infiltrated Mumbai through the sea route and they managed to hold the city and the country hostage and they ended up killing more than 160 innocent civilians. Within hours of these attacks, Indian intelligence agencies attributed the attack to the Lashkar-e-Taiba and they went on to conclusively establish that all the 10 terrorists 
were Pakistani nationals and further investigation by Indian agencies went on to reveal the extent of state support that LET enjoyed in order to carry out this attack. Indian agencies collected solid evidence to show the extent of involvement of Pakistan's ISI in the planning and the execution of the attack. India also managed to identify most of the Pakistan-based handlers who were passing on instructions to these terrorists and it also managed to identify a number of ISI agents who were directly involved in the training and radicalization of these LAT terrorists. So a few months into the investigation, Indian agencies were confident that they had completely unraveled the plot involving the ISI and the LAT. But the arrest of an individual known as David Coleman Headley at the Chicago airport in the United States nearly one year after the attacks sent shockwaves across the Indian security establishment. Because David Headley emerged as one of the key conspirators of the 2611 attacks and the Indian agencies had no clue about him until he was arrested in the United States by the American authorities. Following his arrest, his accomplice Tahavur Rana was also arrested and currently both of them happen to be in American custody. See, to understand this topic further, it is very important to understand the profile of David Coleman Headley and the extent of his involvement in the 2611 attacks. David Headley was an American national of Pakistani origin and his father was a Pakistani diplomat and his mother was an American national. At a very young age, David Headley became addicted to drugs and this brought him under the radar of the Drug Enforcement Authority of the United States. But because of his Pakistani connections and because of his western sounding name, the DEA saw him as a potential agent who could help them infiltrate the drug cartels that operate in the Golden Crescent region covering Afghanistan and Pakistan. So the Drug Enforcement Authority decided not to press any serious charges against David Headley and instead he was offered to turn into an American agent. So his role as a DEA informant and his connections with the drug cartels of Afghanistan and Pakistan brought him closer to the terror groups that were operating in this region and as well as to the ISI. After coming in contact with terror groups such as the Lashkar, the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, he started undergoing radicalization as a result of his hatred against India and the Western countries. So his Pakistani-American identity and his Western sounding name and his close connections with terror groups and drug cartels brought him under the radar of the ISI as well. So these developments brought David Headley under the radar of the FBI and the CIA as well and at some point he turned out to be a classic double agent. Essentially he was working for both the sides and on one hand he was tying up with terror outfits and the ISI and on the other hand he was passing on some information to the American intelligence agencies. So his background and his unique profile convinced the Lashkar and the ISI that he is the right candidate to carry out the reconnaissance of targets in Mumbai in order to execute the 2611 attacks. Reports even indicate that David Headley was personally chosen by Hafi Saeed, the leader of the lashkar e taiba and as well as by the top officers of the ISI who were leading and guiding the attack. So as a part of this mission, David Headley tied up with his friend Tahawur Rana who was running an immigration business in Canada after having retired as a Pakistani army doctor. So by using his friend's business cover, he travelled to India undercover and he went on to establish a travel and immigration business in Mumbai. By using this cover identity, he went on to carry out reconnaissance of the targets and he managed to take detailed pictures, videos and even mark the GPS locations which would be of great help for training the terrorists who eventually carried out the 2611 attacks. So for months together, he easily managed to enter and exit India multiple times and he not only passed on the reconnaissance details to the Lashkar and the ISI but he was also forced to share pieces of this information with the FBI and the CIA as well. So available reports and Indian government sources indicate that the American authorities knew much more about an imminent and impending attack on Mumbai but despite this they revealed only partial details to India. In the months leading up to the 2611 attacks, American authorities had shared some crucial intelligence with Indian agencies. American agencies had warned Indian agencies of an imminent sea bone attack on Mumbai and had even informed that five-star hotels and locations frequented by foreigners might be the likely targets. But all the while, the American authorities 
withheld the identity of David Headley and India was completely unaware of his involvement in the plot. But in retrospect, that is after Headley was arrested in 2009 and after the Indian authorities became aware of his involvement in the attacks, India came to the conclusion that had the United States revealed the identity of David Headley, then probably the attack might have been stopped. And this conclusion was drawn by none other than India's then Home Secretary G.K. Pillai after his retirement. So the reason why the United States chose not to reveal his identity to India despite sharing close counter-terrorism cooperation is because no intelligence agency would like to compromise their sources. So neither did the US reveal his identity before the attacks nor did it arrest him after the attacks. The US allowed him to carry on his task as a double agent for almost one year after the attacks and he was arrested only in 2009 after he went on to plan attacks on a Danish newspaper in Copenhagen. So it was this arrest which made his involvement in the 2611 attacks public knowledge and India felt betrayed by this double game of the United States. So even after being aware of his involvement in the 2611 attacks, the US did not arrest him and it did not inform India about his involvement and it allowed him to retain his ties with the Lashkar, the Al-Qaeda and the ISI because he was still a high value asset for the CIA and the American intelligence agencies who was capable of delivering high value intelligence. So finally, the arrest of David Headley and Tahavur Rana and the American acknowledgement of their involvement in the 2611 attacks and the American refusal to extradite them back to India led to a diplomatic standoff between the United States and India. So as soon as the US briefed India about their involvement and about their arrest, the National Investigation Agency, which had been recently set up after the 2611 attacks, immediately registered a case against them under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act and it sought their extradition to India so that they could be tried in Indian courts and punished accordingly for playing a key role in the planning and execution of 2611 attacks. But to India's shock and surprise, the US refused to extradite them back to India because as expected, the American agencies were not willing to compromise on their sources and assets. Then in order to neutralize any further extradition request from India, the American authorities made Headley enter into a plea bargain and under the plea bargain system, if a convict confesses to his involvement and if he willingly becomes a witness or an approver, then he will be given a reduced sentence by the American judicial system and it also prevents the US government from extraditing him to any country where death penalties exist. So as soon as David Headley entered into a plea bargain arrangement with the US officials, his extradition to India was ruled out even though India and US have an extradition treaty which was signed in 1997. So after having denied India's extradition request, the United States agreed to only provide limited access to a team of NIA officials who managed to interrogate him on American soil under the strict supervision of the American authorities. So currently, David Headley continues to serve a prison term in the United States and he has even turned an approver in some of the cases related to 2611. For example, he gave evidence in a case related to Abu Jundal who was one of the handlers in the Karachi control room who were guiding the 10 terrorists during the 2611 attacks. India managed to arrest Abu Jundal after collaboration with the intelligence agencies of Saudi Arabia and currently he happens to be in Indian custody. So as of now, India has resigned to accept that Headley will never be extradited to India but India still hopes that Tahavur Rana might be extradited in order to face justice in the 2611 attacks case. So this topic is in news because Tahavur Rana, after serving his prison sentence, has been released on bail on compassionate grounds as he has tested positive for COVID-19. But immediately after his release, he has been re-arrested by the American authorities because of the pending extradition request from India. So this makes it quite clear that even though United States is not willing to extradite Headley, it might be willing to extradite Tahavur Rana because it does not see him as big an asset as David Headley. But still, there are a few roadblocks before Tahur Rana could be extradited to India. See, the American legal system, just like the Indian legal system, prohibits double jeopardy. That is, an individual cannot be punished twice for the same crime. So since Tahur Rana has already served a prison term for the 2611 attacks, he cannot be extradited to India if India is pressing the same charges again against him. So in order to bypass these legal challenges, the NIA is seeking Rana's custody in a completely different case. Because Indian investigation has revealed that after the 2611 attacks, 
David Headley and Tavur Rana were involved in planning attacks against the National Defense College and as well as against Jewish religious institutions. So the NIA has registered separate cases for these planned attacks and it has been seeking his custody in relation to these cases. See all these details that we have discussed, even though they are not directly relevant for our exams, it does help us understand the global roots and linkages of terrorism and how it can affect India's national security. Now let's take up another article from page number one, which helps us understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on maternal health and infant health. According to this article, the COVID-19 pandemic has instilled a fear amongst pregnant women with regard to hospital deliveries or institutional deliveries. And as a result, over the last two to three months, there has been a significant reduction in institutional deliveries. Data from Madhya Pradesh alone shows that institutional deliveries have declined by a massive 18.6% after the pandemic broke out. Health experts believe that this decline in institutional deliveries could be because of the fear of pregnant women of catching the virus if they opt for hospital deliveries. This fear and this reduction in institutional deliveries threatens to undo the success that India has achieved under the National Health Mission and under the several schemes that are dedicated towards the well-being of pregnant women, mothers and infant children. Over the last two decades, India has strived very hard to achieve the infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate targets as laid down by the Millennium Development Goals of the UN and now the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. One of the key strategies to reduce IMR and MMR rates is to promote institutional delivery. Because institutional deliveries ensure that both the mother and the child receive adequate nutrition, adequate health care, timely professional emergency services, and moreover, the hospital environment provides for a more safe and hygiene setup, which reduces the chances of infection that could threaten the lives of pregnant women, mothers, and infant children. Now let's take up an article from page number 10. The government of India has invited global vessel owners to flag their ships in India itself in order to take advantage of the recent changes that have been brought in to the Make in India policy. See, recently, the government has revised its Make in India policy and it has said that no global tender would be issued henceforth for public procurement that is under 200 crore rupees. So this change in the Make in India policy means that ships that carry the flags of other countries won't be able to take part in this tender process for public procurement. The government has said that this decision has been taken to promote the domestic shipping industry and to promote cargo transportation in India. According to the government, this decision has been taken to exploit the inherent advantages that India has with regard to shipping. Because India provides a continuous supply of trained seafarers who possess ship management skills that are comparable to global standards. This policy has been designed to promote the Make in India initiative and further promote domestic procurement. So in this regard, it has called upon global vessel owners to flag their ships in India so that they would be able to enjoy the benefits of the recent changes that have been brought in to the Make in India policy. Now let's take up an article from page number 12, which helps us understand how elections to the Rajya Sabha are different from elections to the Lok Sabha. This article is very relevant for prelims because it mostly contains facts related to elections to the Rajya Sabha. First, let us start with the electorate. See, in the case of Lok Sabha, where the MPs are elected on the basis of universal adult suffrage, every citizen who is above 18 years is a part of the electorate. Whereas in the case of Rajya Sabha elections, the electorate is made up of only the elected members of the state legislative assemblies. So only elected MLAs from the respective state legislative assemblies can cast their vote in the Rajya Sabha elections. Now let us look at the term of the two houses. See in the Lok Sabha, the MP enjoys a term of five years and general elections are said to be held once in every five years. In the case of Rajya Sabha, the MP enjoys a term of six years and elections are held in batches once in every two years. So this makes Rajya Sabha a permanent body which cannot be dissolved, unlike the Lok Sabha which is not a permanent body and which is dissolved once in every five years or whenever the government falls. Then in the Lok Sabha, if a seat is vacated due to the death or resignation of an MP, then bipoles are held and the newly elected MP continues to hold the seat for the remaining term of the Lok Sabha. 
it is the same case with regard to the Rajya Sabha as well. When a seat in the Rajya Sabha is vacated due to death or resignation of an MP, by polls are held, and the newly elected MPs continue to hold the seat for the remaining term. Then, as compared to the direct elections of the Lok Sabha, which is held on the principle of majority, in the Rajya Sabha elections are held on the basis of single transferable vote on the principle of proportional representation. So, this makes the Rajya Sabha elections a form of indirect elections, where the elected MLAs are electing the MPs to the Rajya Sabha. But let us not go into the details of the principle of proportional representation and how the single transferable vote system works, because it is not really relevant for our exams. Then another key difference with regard to elections to the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha is that there is no secret ballot with regard to elections to the Rajya Sabha. See, in the Lok Sabha elections, voting is done through secret ballot. That is, the vote cast by an elector has to remain completely confidential and secret, and it should not be revealed to any other person at any point of time. Whereas in the case of Rajya Sabha elections, a system of open ballot is practiced. Under this system, the elected MLA, after casting his vote, he needs to show the ballot to the party's authorized agent, and this has been introduced in order to prevent cross voting. But you should also remember that there is no disqualification for cross voting. This means that an MLA of a particular party can cast his vote to a candidate proposed by another political party. Even the Supreme Court has said that there cannot be any disqualification for cross voting with regard to Rajya Sabha elections. But however, the party is free to take any disciplinary action because the MLA is bound to reveal his vote by showing the ballot to the party's authorized agent. Then another difference is that the nota option, that is the none of the above option does not exist in the case of Rajya Sabha elections. The election commission had introduced the nota option in 2014 and 15, but later it was struck down by the Supreme Court. Because the Supreme Court held that the none of the above option is only for general elections that are held on the basis of universal adult suffrage and it cannot be applied to indirect elections that are held on the basis of proportional representation. Then finally, you should also note that the Supreme Court has allowed the MLAs to cast their vote even before they have taken their oath as an MLA. See, the constitution states that elected representatives, be it an MLA or an MP, they cannot take up any legislative function before taking oath. They can carry out any legislative function only after the oath of office has been administered to them. But the Supreme Court has held that voting for the Rajya Sabha elections does not constitute a legislative function and hence MLAs can be allowed to vote for electing Rajya Sabha MPs even before they have been administered the oath of office. So kindly note down these factual points as they can be very important for prelims and they can also help you in answering a main question asking you to highlight the differences between elections to the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Which of the following can be considered as an application of geotextiles? It is used in geoengineering to reduce the impact of earthquakes on buildings. It is used in climate engineering to absorb particulate matter and reduce air pollution. It is used in coastal engineering to tackle coastal erosion. It is used in smart apparels designed to enhance the performance of athletes and soldiers. The correct answer is option C. Geotextiles are used in coastal engineering to tackle coastal erosion. This question has been asked because the Hindu carries an image on page number 6 which makes a reference to a geotextile mound that has been constructed to prevent sea incursion. See, geotextiles are basically permeable fabrics that are made out of polypropylene or polyester. It is used to strengthen soil against the impact of water. As a part of civil engineering, it is used in coastal engineering in order to protect the coastline, to protect river banks, to strengthen soil in and around canals, dams and embankments. Now let's take up the next practice question. India is directly leapfrogging from Bharat stage 4 to Bharat stage 6 emission standards by skipping Bharat stage 5. This transition is going to directly affect which of the following industries? Automobile, information technology, oil refining, thermal power, coal mining. The correct answer is option B, 1 and 3 only. Implementing the Bharat stage emission standards will always have a direct impact on the automobile sector and as well as on the oil refining industry. 
because these standards have to be implemented by the car makers, by the two-wheeler manufacturers and as well as by the oil refining industries. So naturally, to implement these higher emission standards, these sectors need to make massive investments in research and development in order to upgrade their production facilities, in order to fine-tune their design and ensure that the fuel that they are producing and the vehicles that they are manufacturing are up to mark as mandated by the Bharat Stage Emission Standards. See, the Bharat Stage Norms of India is based on the Euro norms and India has decided to directly jump from Bharat Stage 4 to Bharat Stage 6 from 2020 onwards because India is lagging behind the rest of the world as far as emission standards are concerned. Hence, India has decided to skip Bharat Stage 5 and directly transition to Bharat Stage 6. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 10, the consistent hike in oil prices will help the oil marketing companies to raise much needed finances and cut the upgradation cost involved in transitioning to Bharat Stage 6 standards. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following best describes an annular solar eclipse? It occurs when the dark silhouette of the moon completely obscures the intensely bright light of the sun, allowing the much fainter solar corona to be visible. It occurs when the sun and moon are exactly in line with the earth, but the apparent size of the moon is smaller than that of the sun. Hence, the sun appears as a very bright ring surrounding the dark disk of the moon. It occurs when the sun and the moon are not exactly in line with the earth and the moon only partially obscures the sun. The correct answer is option B. The solar eclipse that we witnessed today was an annular eclipse. It occurs because the sun and the moon are exactly in line with the earth but the apparent size of the moon is smaller than that of the sun. Hence, you get to see a very bright ring also known as the annulus that surrounds the dark disk of the moon. Whereas the first description given over here refers to a total solar eclipse and the third description refers to a partial solar eclipse. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 14 which makes a reference to the annular solar eclipse that we witnessed today. The bright ring or the annulus seen in case of an annular solar eclipse is also known as the ring of fire. And in this image, you can clearly see the differences between a partial eclipse, an annular eclipse and a total eclipse. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2019 prelims paper. Consider the following statements. In the revenue administration of the Delhi Sultanate, the in charge of revenue collection was known as Amil. The Ikta system of Sultans of Delhi was an ancient indigenous institution. The second statement is incorrect because the Ikta system was evolved in Persia and it was later introduced in India by the Delhi Sultanate. Now let's look at the third statement. The office of Mir Bakshi came into existence during the reign of Kilji Sultans of Delhi. This statement is again incorrect because the office of Mir Bakshi, who happens to be the head of the military department, came into being during the Mughals. Whereas under the Delhi Sultanate, the head of the military department was known as Divan e Aris. So the first statement is correct and hence option A is the right answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, drones have disrupted and transformed the nature of warfare, particularly that of hybrid warfare. Examine the statement with examples. The second question, the 2611 attacks laid bare the global roots and linkages of terrorism. Evaluate. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.